Martin Stanley Johnson and Linda Burney. Well, it was the night before budget and all through the nation, pollies and pundits were talking taxation. Back in a minute to do the same. Wednesdays are all new on ABC. Genius, right? <laughs> At 8, Julia Zamiro takes Aussie icon Maggie Beer oh, God. back to where it all began. She's the real deal, everybody. <laughs> She's the joy. Then it's the new season of Gruen. What do I want? Oh, thanks for asking. Better banks. Followed by the weekly with Charlie Pickering. Do you follow the news? Are you a news person? Not at all. <laughs> the best entertainers are on Wednesday nights on ABC and iView. Wednesday, May 23. Gather your family and friends to look up at the stars and help us eclipse the world record for the most people stargazing. To be involved in this momentous event, head to abc.net.au slash stargazing for more info and find a star party near you. You've got two missing boys on your property. Yeah, I've got a station to run. You see, there's this nasty little circle. Mystery Road. You're right in the middle of that circle. Start Sunday, June 3 on ABC and iView. Tomorrow, Scott Morrison's third federal budget. At 7.30, the Treasurer's speech from Parliament House. We're going to provide tax relief for middle-income Australians. Then at 8, an ABC News budget special featuring the first interview with the Treasurer, immediate reaction from the opposition... Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison have nowhere to hide. ...and analysis of the winners, losers and politics from the experts. Let's get to work and get it done. Budget 2018, tomorrow 7.30 on ABC and iView. And welcome to Q&A live from Melbourne. As you can hear, I'm Tony Jones, here to answer your questions. The founder of Get Up and author of New Power, Jeremy Hymans. The Liberal member for Goldstein, Tim Wilson. Social change advocate, Leila Ajaalu. For, uh, author and former British Conservative MP, Stanley Johnson. And the Shadow Minister for Human Services, Linda Burney. Please welcome our panel. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, live on iView and News Radio at 9.35 Eastern Time. It's Budget Eve, of course, but we also have questions on the new power of social media, work-life balance and much more. Let's go to our first question. It's from Tian Crother. Last week, Liberal MP Julia Banks said she could live off $40 per day, despite records indicating that there are virtually no rentals available that New Start recipients can afford, making the benefit seemingly impossible to live on. When will the New Start rate be lifted to support people who are not working? Tim Wilson. <laughs> well, thanks very much for the question. And uh, the New Start, uh, I don't know when it's going to be lifted, but it's obviously something that comes up periodically and it's come up in this topic. Well, what about tomorrow? There's a good opportunity. Uh, well, <laughs> for the budget. Well, if you know something I know about the budget, Tony, uh, you can always announce it on national television. But it goes to the critical point, which is, uh, is New Start something that people can live on easily? And the short answer is no. I couldn't live it on my current lifestyle. I'm not trying to pretend otherwise, and that's what Julia Banks... Uh, was saying. No, she uh, wasn't. She was saying she could live off it. Well, she wasn't. She said she, she said she could live off it, but in the context, she couldn't live in her current lifestyle. But, yes, you can live on it, but it is very, very difficult, and no-one's pretending otherwise. But it's part of a rich matrix of our social safety net. Uh, people on New Start often get other support measures and other concessions available to them, some from the state government, some from the federal government. But very much the focus of New Start is that people don't end up there. The social safety net is supposed to be a trampoline. It's not supposed to be a hammock where people get used to it and accommodated to it. Now, Tim, and, um, I'm just going to break in there because the economist Chris Richards, and he's very far from being a screaming socialist, you'd have to agree. He says the level of dole payments is unnecessarily cruel and that they should be raised by at least $50 a week. Well, I disagree with Chris Richards. Cost of $3 billion on the budget. Because every dollar that's taken to give to some people 
means it has to be taken from other people. And you can live on New Start. It's not an easy lifestyle. No one's pretending otherwise. But when but you're I just, I just, I'm going to interrupt you there once more because I noticed our questioner was shaking her head. What do you think about the idea that you can live off $50 a day? $40 a day, actually. Yeah, I, I don't think you can do it. I think it is unnecessarily cruel. I think there are a lot of people suffering in Australia and I, I, I think you really need to lift it. It's, it's unfair. Tim, quick response and I'll go to the other panellists. Well, <laughs> of course... Of course, the people who are on it are always going to want more money, but the reality is that money has to be taken from someone else. And one of the things, you do have to make sacrifices, that's true. When I was at university uh, or when I was on uh, assistance and benefits, you couldn't live by yourself, you couldn't live independently. You actually needed to pull your money because you needed to share with other people because the biggest cost was housing. Then it's public transport where you get concessions. Then it's energy bills, which is why we've been focused very much on making sure that people can move off New Start and get into jobs. The government has been delivering 1,100 jobs a day to try and provide not that safety net as a hammock, but a safety as a trampoline so people can stand on their own two feet okay. and be able to move off All right, stuff. we'll just jump off the trampoline for a minute. Uh, Jeremy, I can see you want to get in here. Well, look, Tim, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. The money has to come from somewhere else. But that's precisely why the sort of $65 billion proposed of business tax cuts, that's a fantastic place to take the money to increase <laughs> the lives and the livelihoods of, of ordinary people. Well, what we're trying to do is make sure we have the jobs so that people don't stay on New Start, so that we can actually generate the jobs that actually allow people to live lives independently with yeah, dignity. But what with type choice. of jobs are they? Because there has to be the available skill set in order to meet that. Because a lot of people end up on New Start not because they don't have the uh, job availability, but it's that we don't actually have the skills a lot of the time to meet these types of jobs that you're government is actually putting in place? Well, I don't agree. I mean, that's a pretty broad-based statement. I mean, there's been a huge growth in the number of full-time jobs in the economy so that people actually do have those choices. And it's across the whole economy, across the whole country. OK, Tim, we've got you bookended by progressive thought here, but I'm just going to go right. across to the other end of the table and hear what the other side of politics thinks. Linda. Uh, thanks, Johnny and Tony, and hi, everyone. I hope you're well. Um, I could not live on $40 a day. And anyone that says that they can comfortably, uh, they are living in a bubble. Uh, $40 a day for families, uh, when you've got to cover all the, um, all the utilities, mostly rent, and just buying food is almost impossible. People who are on a social service payment should not be seen as bludgers and dole, dole bludgers and, and cheats. They should be seen as people that need the support of government. Uh, the other thing that's really important for people to understand is that New Start is actually the third uh, costing payment when it comes to the social security system. Uh, the most, uh, the most ex expensive part of it, important part of it, is for aged pensioners. Then it's people who are on a disability support pension and then it's new start. So, Linda, I'm just going to interrupt you just for a moment because um, you're obviously passionate about this. I so, am very uh, what's passionate. Labor going to do? Um, well, for example, I'm... would Labor agree to do what Chris Richardson, Conservative economist, says $50 a week increase minimum? Uh, what Labor's saying, and I think people probably saw it today, is on, uh, on coming into government, there will be a full and really in-depth review on the whole social security system because there's so many payments and it's complicated. Um, there is an absolute understanding that New Start uh, is a payment uh, that is uh, very minimal and it's also a payment that is not there, as Tim said, for people to get into a hammock. It's for when people are in between jobs or have not started employment. Um, so the commitment tonight, Tony, is a very in-depth, and I mean in-depth, review. But Linda, of a commitment to a review, system. if I may say so, that's a great politician's way out of actually I... making <laughs> a promise. I mean, we're going to review something. We don't know what's going to happen at the end yeah. of it, and the review happens only when we're in power. Well, I'm, I can't say to you tonight um, that there is going to be an increase in New Start, but I think that if you understand the seriousness of the review that we're talking about, understand the uh, fact that people, uh, particularly within my party, 
do not live in a bubble and understand that New Start is a minimal payment. And what my position is, is that people who are on welfare should be able to live with dignity. And that's the question. So, so quick question. If you can't live off it, you can't leave it where it is, can you? It, uh, well, the, the issue of... I'm just taking by your own words. No, no, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. Um, and I know that this is a very important discussion within political parties, but also broadly. I mean, I, ha I know many people, um, and in my, in my role as human services shadow, I meet many, many, many people. I go to many communities who are, uh, who are trying to survive on New Start. Yep. And I can see the absolute okay. challenge. All right, OK. Um, yeah. Yeah, Stanley, um, you've heard these arguments in Britain, obviously, but do you think that... A, that it is the role of a government to make sure that those who are unemployed can actually live off the amount of money they're given by the government. I, I think we're in a new area altogether. This isn't a zero, <coughs> not a zero-sum game. There's a lot of economic theory out there now which says if you give people a decent income, they will spend that income. Now, the President of France, Mr Macron, has actually proposed not just giving you know, unemployed people income, but giving everybody a basic income. Mm. Mm. And you can work it out in economic terms. By the way, apropos living on $40 a day. I lived for three weeks in a jungle in um, <laughs> New South Wales near <laughs> Moolumba. Mu <laughs> and I tell you, we didn't have $40 a day, but we had 600 calories a day. And I felt really fit on that. <laughs> Hello, I'm not making, a, not making a political point yet. But a political <laughs> not really, because you had an entire television company yeah. making sure of your welfare. So no, I no, think that we was, just, uh, we was I'm a celebrity, let me out of here if I'm... <laughs> I'm a calamity to get me out of oh, here. Okay. But, Tony, surely there's an issue um, that the government's not thinking about. They're talking about, you know, working families, uh, middle-income earners. There are many people, as we know, in our country that live in abject poverty. Yes, you're right. And, uh, and that cannot be ignored, and they are not people that have crawled into a hammock. OK, let's move on, because we've got a lot, quite a lot of questions tonight uh, on different subjects. The next one's from Christopher Milne. Um, we've seen the NAB make billions in profits and sacking thousands of workers at the same time. The Royal Commission into Banking has shown a seemingly unethical system built around taking as much money from the average Australian as possible, both living and dead. Why should Australians further subsidise the big banks and other big businesses through billions in tax cuts? Tim Wilson. Well, firstly, tax cuts aren't subsidies. They're actually uh, when people generate income. So it isn't when you get your tax reduced as an individual, you're not getting a subsidy from the government. You've earned that money and taxes are the contribution that people make towards having a free, a just society. So uh, this would be a reward, would it, for the banks doing a good job? Well, well no, Tony, because... <laughs> I know that the cheap jive you've just made, but the, <laughs> but the reality of it is, is that tax, tax applies to everybody equally. And so you have uh, a company tax structure that covers all companies. Now, we've actually got a differentiation at the moment because part of the government's tax cuts were cut, uh, they were, were reduced, and other ones in the larger companies have not. It doesn't discriminate and only give it to, to banks. It gives it to all of the large businesses. So would it That's be would, would it not possible to, to frame legislation where you didn't give the tax cut to the banks? <laughs> well, of course, we could technically do that, but are we going to now go around and apply different rates of tax on individuals based on whether we agree with their conduct or whether they've done something right or wrong in the past? That would be a path... First, it would make the tax system much more complex, but, uh, and it would lead to people finding ways to make sure that a lot of their businesses weren't in the bank's component mm. of their businesses, so it wouldn't work. But it's actually not an appropriate way to actually design okay. a tax system. So the banks will get the tax cut along with everyone else? Well, if the Senate passes the tax cuts, then yes, uh, all the companies above the threshold will get the, uh, the tax cut and it will enable them to go on create jobs and create the opportunities for the next generation of Australians to stand on the road to hear from feet. both the politicians on this before we move back. Uh, Linda. Well, what we do know is that, um, is that the government is proposing <coughs> a massive company tax break, something between $65 million and $80 million, and at least $17 million of that will go to the banks. Um, and Tim's made the point, and this is what's forgotten often, is that tax cut has not passed the Senate. Um, and that's a really important point to keep in mind. Um, I think that there is absolute shock um, on what's coming out of the Royal Commission. And the idea that there is going to be a big chunk of the company tax cut 
given to uh, the banks, I think, is worrying many Australians. Stanley, um, amidst of your... You've been, a, you've been an MP in Britain, and, um, I'm just, and you've watched this closely, so what are your, what are your thoughts on this? I would it's have a thought, dilemma for the government, isn't well, it? Well, I tell you something, you know, speaking with all the humility of, a, of an outside observer, <laughs> I, I do wonder whether just at this moment this is the, this is the moment to give the, the bankers a, a tax cut. I, you know, I just think that that is not, not something. You've got plenty of other things to do, but I just rather wonder whether the banks need to be right up there in the firing line in terms of getting the tax cut. I would have thought, can't they, can't they just sort of hang around a bit? But this is the point, Stanley, is that it's not going just to banks. It's going to all the people who are above a threshold in terms of business activity. And if we had just a tax cut for just banks, that would be disgraceful as outrageous as excising them out as well. If you actually want a fair and just system around taxation, you need consistency in rates. You need as broad a base as possible. You need to, be, to cover it in a more universal fashion. So your point is right, but that's not what's happening. Yes, but the theory, sorry, the theory is that the company tax cut will create more jobs and increase... Uh, increase the salaries of people working in those companies, and there's no evidence that that's going to be the. Just before we move on, just, no, I'm just going to I'm going to just go to the next question quickly because it is from a banker, and uh, we really get that opportunity. <laughs> uh, Daniel Nags. Hi. Um, as a small business uh, banker, I've seen the impact that the Royal Commission has had, um, especially for my customers. So that's not only been a reduction in approval for lending, but also uh, overall suspicion and uh, distrust in regards to the bank. Mm. So my question is. As we know, lending is an important part of business for most people. And what can we do or what can be done to ensure trust is restored so that the economy can be stimulated to include a healthy business growth? Let's go outside the politicians for a minute. Um, so this is a, the notion here is the bank's reputation has uh, is been damaged by the mm. Royal Commission uh, and now the banks themselves have stopped lending as much. Is that what you... No, it's just, um, it's just that there's been uh, a bit of a, a change with um, people trusting to go to the banks as well as uh, mm. the, the whole environment, which um, has uh, been a struggle for a lot of small businesses who might have uh, since relied on that. So um, when you see what happened in the Royal Commission, just sorry to grab yeah, no, you here, no, but when, fine. when you've watched what's happened in the Royal Commission, the, the big banks and the kind of um, well extraordinary scandals yep. that we're seeing exposed, do you think people are right to stop trusting 100%. banks? 100%. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, uh, ethical um, and uh, financial ethics is something that's extremely important and we're seeing a lot of that come to light. So there's no dispute there and that's not something that I um, disagree with. OK, Jeremy, um, you know, part of your job is to sort of do campaigns to uh, make people think differently about things. Could you ever do a campaign <laughs> on behalf of the banks? Well, well, the banks make it very easy to campaign <laughs> against them. Um, they, they, make, they make our job effortless. Um, look, I, I, I think... Um, People are not going to trust. We live in this age, right, where people are deeply sceptical of institutions. And for good reason when you see things like the banks. So people, until institutions actually start trusting people and actually take their agency seriously, people are going to turn away from um, the big banks. They're going to start to work out other ways to do these things peer to peer. And so um, I think it'd be a very tough job right now defending the banks in Australia. And actually the work I think is actually to push on things like the tax cuts and say, you know, is this really, you know, can't we be more bold and more imaginative as a country than just to whip out the old tax cuts thing again, right? There's so many opportunities for like progressive economic policy, retrain uh, and offer lifelong learning to every Australian, um, opportunities to incubate small businesses. So the idea that, you know, we're stuck in this time warp where, as Linda says, you know, all the economic evidence is that this doesn't work, mm -hmm. real wages are stagnant while corporate profits go up 20% a year, and yet we're stuck having this debate about business tax cuts. We can do better as a country. I'm just going to quickly whip across to Stanley again. So I think you do believe that uh, corporate tax cuts actually do create jobs. <laughs> Well, in theory, they do. I mean, if, if people are getting the money and they're spending the money, that is going to feed back, back into the economy. No, the point I made was, was this the politically right moment? And, I, and just picking up Tim's point, surely there must be a way of saying some uh, corporations that deserve these taxes, others don't. And in this particular case, I'm not right in thinking that there's been a little bit of misbehaviour by the bank. So couldn't you, construct some, some, couldn't you construct some criterion which says you're not actually eligible because, you know, you've got X, Y and Z 
uh, scored up against you in the, in the book. I would have thought it must be possible. Tim, to you, you, you might find you don't have any choice but to consider that because um, uh, the Senate is going to control whether mm. the tax cuts go through or not. And sure. It's very unlikely they're going to let tax cuts go through to the banks. So are you prepared to compromise if someone comes to the government and says, well, yes, we'll vote for this, but if you cut the banks out? I suspect not, because in the end, for the reasons I outlined before, you actually don't want an environment where you're creating these special classes of businesses that get the tax cuts and don't get... There are not all banks, by the way, that are covered by the tax cuts uh, have been caught up in problems in the Royal Commission. You're exactly right. There have been um, uh, businesses that have seen opportunities or market opportunities from banks uh, that have done the wrong thing, and we have smaller banks that operate and have come in, particularly when they've stopped, larger banks have stopped lending to smaller communities, to smaller businesses, and they've taken that opportunity, the market opportunity that's come from that. They would also be penalised by excising banks out of this. So okay. it's a bad policy position, which will inevitably only lead to a situation where uh, it, we now pass moral judgments about who pays tax and how much. Okay, Leila wants to get in. Yeah, I mean, I think we just need to look at this from a big picture perspective. Why do we have taxation? Basically, it's the levers of society. We put taxation on things in order to influence consumer behaviour and to ultimately challenge the way our society evolves. So I actually completely agree that an ethical code of conduct that applies to our big players in our industry that are influencing society is an important conversation to have and that the government should be thinking about the types of things we're incentivizing. Because sure. ultimately, the decisions you make today will determine the kind of future that we're living in. And whether we keep repeating these types of cycles, where big institutions get so big, they're too big to fail, and they ultimately start to exploit the very people that they were set up to serve in the beginning, which is the situation that we're in right now. And unfortunately, we're going to continue to see that unless we start to have some really significant forward thinking with the types of incentives we put in place through the economic measures that our mm. country has. <laughs> yeah. back straight to the question. Yes. I don't disagree with most of what was just said. I just think the tax system is a really bad way to do it. Because if you go back right to the start of the question, it was largely about trust and how we're going to rebuild the trust in the institutions of the banks. And I think that particularly what you need to see more of is building a code of conduct of ethical behaviour, yeah. particularly within people within banking institutions. And because it's not just about the government yeah. holding people to account, it's people within industries holding them to account as well, and including peer-to-peer -peer accountability. Uh, and I'd like to see the financial services sector develop those types of codes of conduct where banking is a profession that's highly valued and respected by each other, but equally, if you do the wrong thing, that your peers punish you as much okay, as Tim. government. <laughs> we've got, uh, we've got a, a broader question on uh, taxation. It's from Stephen Priorelio. <laughs> <laughs> Good try, Tony. Um, <laughs> Did my best. Yeah, that's right. So how do we get from talking about the need for dramatic tax cut to begin executing it. We always seem to talk about tax cuts, which is only actually a component of tax reform. Our politicians seem to care more about their political scoreboard, and the media continually focuses on the trivial, steering public attention away from what's important. Yeah, Linda Burney. Um, I'm not sure what you mean about political scoreboard, but thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Look, I think the uh, whole question and debate around tax um, is something that's dumbed down um, sizably in this country. Taxation is important. If we didn't have taxation, we wouldn't have hospitals and schools and all the things that are delivered from a tax system and the tax that we pay. But I think the point that you're making is that we never have a full discussion about taxation and taxation reform. And then, so you get little bits and pieces and end up with a system that perhaps not, is not serving us as well as it should. Um, the, the other point, of course, is that when you have a think about the tax cuts that the government has announced in the budget that we don't know about tomorrow night, um, it's all about, um, quite frankly, an election bud budget and making th people think that paying tax is bad and we're going to cut your tax. And when you have a look at actually what's been announced, uh, the least you earn, the more tax you're going to pay. Well, the ABC, uh, Linda, is reporting tonight that tax cuts for lower and middle income earners in tomorrow's budget will amount to, at the maximum, $10.50 a week. Um, now, are you, would you say that is a decent tax cut? 
Um, I don't think that's a very decent tax cut when you go to buy a cup of coffee, for example, and it's $5. I mean, I think that when you're having a look at, if you're going to reform the tax system, then properly reform it um, and make decisions that are going to um, assist people in uh, the best way that it can and not assist those that don't actually need the cut. And we have been arguing consistently against this huge uh, company um, tax cut uh, because we think that $65 million could be better spent in the sorts of things I've mentioned, including hospitals, um, education and the like. Uh, Tim Wilson, so um, the question is really is about whether um, doing individual tax cut initiatives is enough, whether there should be broad-reaching tax reform. It's where we started the program at the beginning of this year, actually, with economists saying it's a bad idea, just have tax cuts, and the corporate tax cut alone is not the right thing to do unless you have broad tax reform. Everyone well, loves talking about tax this much, Tony. Yeah. It's like, tax, tax, tax! <laughs> That's so the, 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 the budget. budget. <laughs> uh, so, in short, I agree. I'd much rather see broader-based tax reform. Um, we're heading in the right direction, but it's only one part of the story. Because a tax system has to be just. <coughs> it can't uh, sit in isolation um, and not have a sense of justice at the anchor at the heart of it. And, Essentially, our tax system and how we even look at our tax system at the moment is wrong. We're looking at a horizontal approach to, uh, to justice, which is some people are earning incomes, let's get them to pay more. Some people are earning less, let's tax them, tax them less. Rather than looking at how tax should actually be approached, which is across people's life cycles, and looking at who's paying what taxes at different stages of life. Because the reality is, at the moment, there are a huge number of people who are not paying tax. And the traditional analysis would say, oh, that's unemployed people because they're not earning any income. But in fact, what we've got now is this huge imbalance where most of the taxes are paid by people between the ages of 35 and 55. Yet most of the beneficiaries of the tax system are people up over the age of 55. Well, what's your point with and, that? Well, the point is that we actually have an imbalance. <laughs> well, the people who are earning the taxes, uh, paying the taxes, aren't necessarily the people who are getting the benefits of the tax. In fact, if you do a proper analysis of the tax system over life cycles at the moment, the people who are aspiring to opportunity and to achieve things for security for their family are actually paying the most tax. And the people who hold the most wealth, or portionally the most wealth, are actually paying the least tax. There's a difference between being, having wealth and earning income. So millennials so, um, are people who are 65 years old that have paid tax their entire Lives. Mm -hmm. And the tax system was set up on the assumption that they would die at the age of 68. And we're going to have to confront that reality. <laughs> That's the time and the thought process around an ageing population that we need to have an honest conversation. And there's shock and response when people say that. But that's the reality of how it's set up. And the people who are paying the price for that are people between the age of 35 and 55 who carry 71% of the federal tax burden through income tax. Um, just a quick one. Uh, the ABC is reporting. Uh, what's your view? It's uh, $10.50 maximum for lower and middle income earning families, according to the ABC's report. That's the, the level of the tax cuts. Um, if that's the extent of it, would you be comfortable with that? Well, that's only one step towards bigger tax reform, which is what I'd like to see. But, yes. of course, it's a, it is relief that people need because the reality is there are huge pressures on families and households and it will actually enable people to stimulate the economy more and uh, employ more people. <coughs> and Ten dollars a week. Well, absolutely, because in the end that's ten dollars that people either use to offset debt, to lead to more consumption, um, to drive the economy. Tony, in, just, in yeah. the UK we tend to call this intergenerational equity and we have a situation where the old vote a lot and they're always voting themselves you know better and better you know, pensions and better and better you know old age provision <laughs> and of course you're right i mean in many ways the younger generation is paying for that That's so right. i do think we have to think you need compulsory there. voting in your country that might change the <laughs> oh well it might it might yeah. there's a serious <laughs> issue of intergenerational equity at yeah. the heart of our nation yeah. And, uh, and we're not alone. This is common across many Western liberal democracies. Let, let's hear from, so let's hear from Jeremy about that, because he's he obviously fighting the good fight on that subject most of his life. Yeah, I, mean, I, just, I just find it... Uh, I mean, I agree with you that tax, the tax system needs deep reform, but I just I find it um, a little despairing 
um, how narrow the debate is. Yeah. Mm. Like we're stuck here as if tax cuts are the only lever mm, for policy absolutely. that we have. And Australia is this incredibly lucky society in the sense that we've got all this wealth, we've got all this opportunity, and we're sort of squandering it on, you know, a $10 tax cut and that's it, and then give the rest to business. Like we can construct, I think, a more interesting economy because lots of people are going to get left behind by automation, mm -hmm. right? And those people need to be retrained. And we sure. need to guarantee, um, and I mean, I'm sure, Tim, you know, you'd support some of these plans, but the government is, is basically trotting out a, a, a kind of 1990s era agenda. And so, you know, from my perspective, we need people to be agitating for something bigger and bolder than what we're getting. Leila, do you, uh, uh, I, do you I mean, I uh, you yeah. sound like you're very frustrated <laughs> by the debate. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but I didn't get taught tax in school, and it's really hard to figure out. And it's really one of those key life skills that it's not about a $10 cut that's an excess... Sorry, those words came out wrong. An extra $10 a week that's going to make me vote for you or vote for someone else. It really should be about dedicating that kind of economic surplus to collective benefits. So whether it be addressing a you know, catastrophic recycling disaster situation we have going on or perhaps protecting the Great Barrier Reef or any of the other natural resources that we would probably all donate $10 a week to see protected and conserved for our future generations, which is what intergenerational equity is about. You guys with the power, making sure that you make decisions today that don't screw it up for the rest of us. OK, well, it, it has to be said. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. It has to be said, we haven't seen the budget yet. Sorry, it's probably got an awful I, lot more than $10 tax cuts. I think it. what needs to be said here is that we do not live in an equal society. Mm -hmm. We really don't. Um, and there are many people, particularly uh, Indigenous people, for example, uh, many people who are considered to be, um, you know, uh, welfare cheats, that are doing it really, really hard. And a, and a, and a government's job is to, is to bring about equity. Um, and I don't see what we're looking at now at bringing about that equity. Thank you very much. Now, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the details. The next question comes from Shireen D'Souza. My question is for Jeremy Hymans. In your ideas about new power, you reflect on open, participatory, peer-driven movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter. However, fake news, populist views and contentious propaganda, as seen with Brexit and the Trump campaign, are also open, participatory and peer-driven. So how do we, as a society, who are willing to embrace these new power models foster a more inclusive rather than a polarised future? Well, I think that's exactly the right question. The, the stakes at this moment in history are huge, right? So the way we talk about new power, it's this essential skill in the 21st century. The people who are sort of getting ahead are the people who can conjure the crowd, right, and get the crowd to follow them. And that's a new set of skills, this digital crowd. And you're absolutely right, Donald Trump, mastered this art, right? During 2016, much better than Hillary Clinton, he had this vast decentralised social media army. And the message he sent to those people was, you know, an empowering one to those people. You know, when a white supremacist would tweet some hate, he would retweet it and then not apologise. And the message that sent was, do your worst. You know, when a protester, or he would say to his protesters uh, at his rallies, he would say, look, if you punch one of my protesters, I'll pay your legal fees, right? So you're absolutely right. The stakes are that in a world in which um, who better conjures the crowd is going to win, and that's true of everyday people and it's true of politicians, it's up to those of us on the side of a, a better world to figure out how to do this, right? The climate scientist needs to be as good at prosecuting their argument as the climate denier. And the white paper and the symposium just won't be enough. So I think in order to build a more participatory world, we need those of us who want to build one of those worlds uh, to really uh, lead and champion the fight before the bad guys do. Now, Jeremy, it sounds like you're talking about quite a dangerous development. New power has, you would argue, a dark side and a light side. And I imagine you think you're on the, the right side or the progressive side of the argument. <coughs> but if you look at how Steve Bannon and others mm. used it in the United States um, in support of Trump, but also in support of 
other broader and far-right causes. Yes. It's a pretty dangerous phenomenon, isn't it? I mean, demagoguery, possibly on both sides of the equation, um, sounds like a, a likely outcome. Well, I think that's right. So it's certainly true that those on the side of hate start at an advantage because they can provoke, uh, you know, they're unbound by facts or reality, so that means that you can come up with some really fantastic stories. But actually, I think there are some really inspiring uses of social media that point the way. If you remember after the Sydney siege, right, the, the Lint massacre, uh, that I'll ride with you movement began. Mm. And it didn't come from a big organisation. Uh, it didn't even come from get up, it came from ordinary people who were self-organising and this act of solidarity that um, Muslim Australians were worried about their safety in that environment, that um, non-Muslim Australians would ride with them and offer them solidarity. So for all the moments of hate, you also see these incredible waves um, of, uh, of human goodness. And so the work, I think, is uh, those of us who are championing those values to get better at this new power. Now, one last question before I throw it around the panel. Was Vladimir Putin <coughs> using new power mm. uh, when he unleashed his spy agencies into the social media networks of the United States <laughs> uh, to influence at a micro level individual mm. and collective groups of voters? Well, was that new power as well? Well, indeed. We like to say about uh, Vladimir Putin, old power at home, new power abroad. Right? So his, you know, at home he's all about containment, he's a fairly traditional authoritarian, right? But, um, but, but, but in the rest of the world he's using these skills very effectively to manipulate societies that are more open. But in a sense that's a bit of Donald Trump's model too, right? We call him the platform strongman, right? Because he's brilliant at using social media, but it all ladders up to this authoritarian value proposition where he alone can fix it. Um, I'm going to bring Stanley in here. Because you've written a book, actually, uh, Stanley, which is a novel, but it basically proposes the idea that, that Brexit was also uh, well, a, a place where new power, put in those terms, was Yes, used. I mean, Ms. <coughs> Mr Sousa's question was really is how do you, how do you winnow out the, you know, the bad uses of, of new power from the good uses of new power? And, and yes, for the purposes of my, of my book, I said... Uh, the, 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 the Russia, Putin, whatever you like. I didn't call him Putin, by the way, I called him Popov. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's close. Ego Popov, ego Popov. Well, the, uh, the answer is we know for a fact more and more evidence of, of how that played out in the United States. We appear to see it playing out now in Britain. We have this, uh, this um, new Labour Party a chap called Jeremy. I suppose you call him Jezza in, um... <laughs> in, 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 Jeremy called. No, we call him Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, more and more it appears that a lot of stuff which to do with the great enthusiasm for Corbyn um, in the general election last year was created by you know, the trolls and so on. And my point in this book, which, by the way, you forget, it's called Compromat, by the way, just in case we fail to mention that. My point is that, <laughs> my point is, Tony, that actually, if you look at the Brexit vote, you will see that that was vastly influenced also by uh, 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 the Russian network. I won't go into the details. And, and, uh, and a bloke called Boris, uh, oddly uh, enough. Well, <laughs> um, no, but the point I'm getting, but going back to the topic, I do think there is a problem. How do you actually winnow out the good, the good new power from the bad new power? It's, it's very, very difficult. But I think it's, I think it's un a bit unfair on Jeremy Corbyn, whatever we think of him, right? I mean, I think we, 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 you know... <laughs> and, and right, and, and the book made clear, leaders like this are, are winning today because they're able to generate intensity. Right, you think about that movement, the momentum movement, that was, is his sort of new power flank, right? And as we argue in the book, the currency now is intensity. And so political leaders on both sides that are able to generate what is very genuine support in his case are the ones who are getting ahead, and that is winning out, Well, you I say think, very genuine moderation. support, but you, it's been traced back to, you know, four different places in, in Russia who were trolled out. Often they're, they're called bots, by the way. <laughs> they're, not even, they're not even people. They're machinery which keeps on producing the same, the same stuff. So I think there's a bit of a danger in your new power. Um, I'm hey. going to bring, bring... Hang on, I want to hear from uh, Layla. So new power, old power, um, where do you sit? Well, power as a concept is basically a resource that we trade, right? So this guy has a lot of power because he's an elected official in our political representation. I, as a woman, have a lot less power as a commodity in the world. World. So power as a resource is something we need to think about it in an objective sense and good and bad makes it very complicated because it evokes all of these different ideas in our head. And that's actually really one of the things that I'm thinking about sitting here is that power is actually 
really about how our minds respond to what information we receive. And humans have a predisposition for something called a negativity bias. And what happened with a lot of the current political systems in the UK and in the US was to evoke fear and moral panics and to use framing that, ev that hijacks the amygdala in our brain and makes us have a flight, flight or freeze response. And then ultimately you are so limited in your decision making, you end up being manipulated through the system that the, the kind of orchestrators of that political ideology get you so to. So are you saying it's actually easier to manipulate people using fear than opportunity? Definitely. And if you look you categorically look at all of our media, social media, it is uh, totally hijacking the negativity bias. And the thing about humans is we also then have this kind of conflicting optimism bias, which means that for us individually, we see the future of our own lives as being positive. So whilst we see all this negative stuff in our Facebook feeds and we feel pretty crappy that day, when we go to bed at night, we imagine that, you know, climate change, it's really not going to affect us. So it's okay. So we have this very conflicting uh, experience of, of encountering these kind of very powerful forces on us. Okay. I'm going to go to another question on this subject from Claire Green. As students, we're constantly berated for the content we upload online. If we aren't being mocked for sharing memes as social commentary or for narcissistic selfie culture, quoting Mr. Hamans, then it's ongoing disapproval for utilising our voices and our opinions. Young people and new media are such a powerful presence, so why do older generations seem so fearful of us and our capacity to incite change? Mm. Now, before we go to the older generations, I'll go to Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably, you're certainly older than our questioner. Old enough, old enough. <laughs> well, look, I, I would say um, that your generation is incredibly inspiring on a lot of fronts, actually. So you think about those Parkland kids, right? These are kids who just intuitively understand how to use new power. Just explain to anyone who doesn't know who they are, so most the, of us will. These are the high school kids who, after that horrible massacre in Florida, rose up and have built the most, the most promising movement against the NRA in decades. Mm -hmm. And why? Because these kids intuitively understand new power. They can mobilise a crowd. Um, they understand how to tell stories. Those memes, those emojis, they matter in the currency of our age, right? So I do think that um, when we move away from some of the trivia, and I think a lot of these tech platforms are distracting us, right, with cat videos. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> but there's a lot of cat videos. But when you see people deploy the same tools, right, to change hearts and minds, I think we, we really have a shot of taking <coughs> on some of these entrenched old power institutions. And very briefly, what about that idea that fear is a, a bigger motivator than, um, let's say, optimism or opportunity to change things? 100% true, which means we have to work all the harder to send positive messages yep. and create positive We have to reframe the debate so that we remind ourselves that there's a possible alternative to the narrative that is constantly told to us, that we're going to die from some horrible catastrophic event that we don't have any agency over. And that's the problem, is that your, your generation are constantly told if it's not climate change, it's something else that's going to mean that you don't have a future. And that's a really terrible way to live, day in, day out, to think that you're not going to have a future as good as the present. And so for me personally, in the work that I try to do is to give people the tools to reimagine the future so that it is more positive. Because you know what? It's not defined. Mm. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. OK. Let's hear from... I actually quite like to hear from uh, the politicians of the panel to see where they are in any way threatened by new power. Tim. We're not threatened by a new power. In fact, I think it's pretty exciting. You know, I like the Trying to work out a way to get them new power advocates to vote for the Liberal Party. Well, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I always do is take a very rosy and positive approach on my social media wherever I can when I'm pushing yeah. out content because it's a good thing. I want people to be happy. I want people to see that what we're putting forward is optimistic. But I'm also very conscious of the need to be able to speak to every people, every person in the, um, the political cycle. So one of the reasons why I'm very, you know obsessed almost on intergenerational equity and addressing the fundamental intergenerational inequity at the heart of our tax and transfer system is it has such a big impact on you. And when you look at politicians overseas who have obviously built political movements, and Jeremy Corbyn has been part of this, he's actually focused and talked to the concerns and the issues that affect young people and use that as the basis of political support, but it's also to achieve what he thinks is obviously a desirable political objective. I obviously don't agree with his political objectives. I'd like to see a more um, just system, particularly for the whole operations of our society, and being optimistic and using the power of social media is critical to that. Um, I'm going to throw it to... Uh, I'll come to you in a minute, yep, Stanley, yep. because I would like to hear from you. But, uh, Linda, um, it was said that Barack Obama, uh, yeah. like... 
uh, like Trump, used new power mm. uh, in order to get elected, that he that he actually used new power to get elected and then governed with old power. But leave that aside, is, is new power, <coughs> is this kind of idea something that will motivate the Labor Party uh, when it seeks to gain office in the next election? Uh, well, obviously, um, any, all political parties are looking very carefully at this. And I don't disagree with anything that has been said so far, but I do think there is another dimension. and. It would be wrong, Tony, unless we mention uh, those other dimensions. And every generation has had its challenges. We grew up in a generation thinking that world, the world was going to be blown up through a nuclear mm. arms mm. race. So every generation has its challenges. Um, and I you know, very much listened to the young woman that just spoke. What concerns me about what we might call new power, and I am horrified that I'm even seeing myself do it, <laughs> where you talk, you know, you read in sound bites. If anything's more than a, than a paragraph long, it's too long, um, and you start limiting um, the way in which you you see things. If it's you know, but by way of social media, and the other thing is this: is that I think social media is crucial. It's important. I use it a lot, and it is about everything that we've heard. But it's also got a really bad side. Um, and the thing that worries me most about social media, and if you might call it new power, is the capacity for bullying. Yeah. Um, and it's constant, it doesn't finish at the school gate. Um, and I think that we can laud this as much as we ought to, but we also have to recognise that there are some very sinister downsides yeah. mm. in the way in which um, new power is being exercised. It could be by way of meddling in um, elections, but it can also be at a very, very personal level with mm. terrible consequences. Can I make a point to the politician? <coughs> Before you do, I just yeah. want to hear from Stanley. Oh, sure. Sorry. I wanted to pick up on this. When I was <coughs> coming in on the plane today, I read your book. Oh. Um, brilliant book, New Path. But one, <laughs> one thing which really struck me was an example you gave, and that was the NRA with not very, very much money, it was in some western congressional area, and they managed to get rid of two either senators or congressmen through a, a, invoking something called congressional recall procedure. Okay. And you pointed out that they'd actually used this new power with a trickle-down sort of way. And on the other side of the thing, on, on the good guy side, you had Bloomberg spending millions and millions and millions mm -hmm. trying to bring in, you know, gun control yeah. laws in, right. in Congress. That's so I'm trying to make the point that it is a two-edged sword very much, mm. this, this new power. And I, I absolutely support L Linda here. You've got to be careful. Right. Jeremy. Yeah, and that's, by the way, why, in the same way that Bloomberg wasn't able to win by just raining money down, I don't think the Business Council of Australia's movement uh, <laughs> efforts uh, that they announced this week uh, to counter groups like GetUp is going to succeed. I just wanted to make one quick point, which is <laughs> that, um, that politicians, right, that government needs to get better at new power as well, right? So we think about our lives, the Instagram, all these, all these apps, um, Uber, they give us these feedback loops, they're easy to use, they're frictionless, and uh, then we encounter government, right? And government is faceless and it's cold uh, and sometimes... Gee, it thanks. What was that? No, no, no. But this is why it Just matters, about right? Tim, not because you. That's why you we know, come on these programs, Linda, it so might, that we can it be faceless. Might, it might feel trivial, Linda, but un until governments get better at providing those experiences, those feedback loops, until government gets more participatory, because we live in this age where people are hungry to participate, then we're going to get more and more sceptical of the institutions that we actually need to preserve. And I really worry about that. Brief one. Um, I mentioned that about Obama, and I actually yeah. did pick up that up from your book, as yes. a matter of fact. But yeah. the idea that Obama got elected with new power and governed with old power, yeah, just briefly on that. Well, point. he did, right? So he builds this <coughs> movement, but, but he doesn't build the, bring the movement in with him to office, right? And that's, you know, he's not a particularly participatory president. He's very conventional. Unlike, and, unlike Trump. Unlike Trump. So Trump's actually governing with new power too, which is very dangerous. And, and Obama's failure to elect his successor, I think, is in large part because his movement didn't move without him. Okay, you're watching Q&A live and interactive. Our next question comes from Chris Sillick, who lives with cerebral palsy and will use an iPad to ask his question. 
I have recently received an offer for a specially designed apartment which would enable me, for the first time as a 34 year old, to live independently. These apartments are designed to meet all the NDIS standards. But I have not been able to secure my NDIS funding. My application is constantly hitting dead ends and going in circles and it now appears that I may miss out on this apartment due to red tape. The NDIS was supposed to be set up specifically for people with disabilities to achieve their goals and to have more equitable lives. So, why is this rollout so difficult and inflexible? Great question, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh... Okay, Linda, I'm going to start with you and then I'll hear from Tim. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, the NDIS is one of the most revolutionary, important things I think that's happened in this country for a long time. Um, and the theory, as you know, uh, was to provide uh, people with a disability independence and a choice about what sort of services they would buy in. But you are right, um, and uh, it would be very wrong to challenge you because you're living uh, with a disability and you're living with the consequences of a rollout that was perhaps too fast. Um, and also, I know coming into my office, Chris, there are many people uh, that are supposed to be in receipt of an NDIS package, and there are many people coming in that are working or trying to work the, with the NDIS system and are finding it extremely difficult, particularly getting the NDIS package that they're supposed to get, which, watch, which is what you were describing. I, I do believe that there is inadequate training and I think that some of the people doing the assessing, which is what you've struck, um, of the needs are perhaps not well trained enough. Uh, Tim, now, I'm, I'm, I mean, obviously you're in government, so you've got more chance, I suppose, of, uh, of, of intervening and doing something about this. I mean, when you hear a case mm. like that, does it make you want to sort of step down and go and find out more and actually see if you can personally fix the problem? We do. Um, we get people that come yes. into our office all the time. Linda would be the same. Every member of the House of Representatives or Senate would experience this. And so, you know, it's always in these situations that we're... It's deeply unfortunate. I'm sorry about the, the circumstance. Because, as Linda outlined, it is actually incredibly complex. Because it's not just that we're introducing a new federal government program. We've also seen the removal of a lot of state government services that are being replaced as part of the NDIS, which has been a huge part of the tension that has come out so often I'll have people who come and say I used to get this but now I don't get this under the NDIS but I did get it under the state government system and our task is to help people directly find a way to navigate the system towards resolution so they get the support they can get. Now obviously without the details of an individual case uh, it's hard to reflect on what's occurred but if it's bureaucratic problems that have led to the stall leading to you not being able to secure that housing, it's deeply unfortunate and it's the sort of thing that uh, you should definitely be raising, obviously in public, uh, but on top of that directly with your uh, Member should of Parliament be because up. we can find ways to work with NDS yeah. provide, NDIS providers. So Tim, uh, it would be nice to think, and I'm sure that everyone sitting out there is thinking that, very few of us are actually in the government, it'd be nice to think that a government representative now hearing Chris's story, mm. would actually go after the program, Absolutely. find out sure. what's going on, and actually see what they can do about it. Of course. It. And that's... <laughs> Make no mistake, if you want to contact, contact me tomorrow, obviously, the details, I'm more than happy to do it, as we do Absolutely. every single day, as Linda does, as everybody else does, but you need the details in order... Not sure, to but it's kind of important, through. isn't it? And, in, in a sense, what you could do here, possibly, is to... Is to here's a case study. Yes. You can solve this one, and then everyone else has a similar case study would automatically be solved, and then we this logjam might break. It's yes. A, yes. And no. Systemic problems. Yes. It, it, there's systemic problems, but behind every single uh, person with a disability is a human story, which is not as straightforward as fitting into a box. Mm. And so every case often has variabilities again between states. So what we'll do is we'll grab your details and um, we'll get addressed first thing. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, 
to make sure that we can try and make sure that it uh, doesn't occur again. <coughs> Jeremy, you, you were talking just yeah. a moment ago, actually, yeah. about um, the nature... Really, not, not talking about government representatives so much, but the nature of the bureaucracy set that's, up that's to right. deal with humans. Mm. That's mm. right. I mean, it's so... It, it, you know, government can be so faceless and cold. It, it, it's like doesn't often respect the people that it serves, right? You think of these this robo-debt phenomenon, right, mm. where the government's doing this robo-debt thing and it's more important for the government to automate the way uh, the, the dole payments work than it is to actually serve ordinary people and not give them these really traumatic experiences. And that's just a sign of this broader problem, right, which is government doesn't have... It isn't, isn't oriented toward... Um, serving people, making it really easy to actually get the help that you need. And I think that's something that everybody could actually agree on, right? I mean, I don't think that um, progressives or conservatives disagree on the need to have a government that's more participatory and that's more responsive to ordinary people, but it requires getting off the high horse a little bit uh, and actually engaging in some of these new tools and tactics, the, the sort of stuff we talk about in the book. Later. Yeah, and it's really about systems design because ultimately the experience that I'm sure your whole family are having is an extreme frustration with a very, very, very badly designed system. Not just in the way the policy is designed, but the entire user experience. Well, it's a system that's evolving, you'd have to say, and let's hope it gets better. But even just the, the, the front end user experience, like the phone calls right. you have to make, the paperwork you have to fill in. I mean, if you, got, if you got to log your hours, you could possibly send him a little invoice for the amount of time you've spent on that. Because that's really what we're looking at here. And that externality is something that his budget doesn't account for, which is the time that people spend looking after family members and making sure that we have a more equitable society. So I feel like, you know, ultimately the government needs to think about the way in which we can design services with the same beauty and ease of access as Facebook or Instagram, That's which right. is really just about understanding the human experience and being more focused on more than that. Yes. delivering <laughs> yeah. an outcome with well, the same use the same design look design basically influences our entire life every single second of every single day and all bureaucratic systems are not designed by designers no one has actually thought about the human centric experience of what it means to interface with a government policy or procedure That's right. and so what happens is we immediately go to encounter these bureaucratic systems and it's frustrating it's annoying and you end up in these cycles where it's wasting everyone's time, the government's resources in paying for those resources, and humans are getting even more and more disassociated with these services and provisions. But, but a key part of the system is about accountability and making sure that people are not being taken advantage of. And this is where some of the... I mean, I'm somebody who dislikes bureaucracy intensely, but a critical part of it has to be about securing accountability for how taxpayers' money is spent and to make sure that people are getting the services they're expecting. So I'm not disagreeing okay. that we can All change, right. but it's not as straightforward um, as saying... Stanley, do you have any question. thoughts on this? <laughs> My view is that Australia has a pretty brilliant medical system. I spent the afternoon in a medical centre not, not far from Melbourne, and I say to myself, if we only had in Britain the kind of efficient medical service you have here, we would be saving ourselves a whole lot of money and delivering a much better job. Now, I can't speak uh, to, to Chris's um, problem, but all I can say is, on the whole, my view is Australia is making fantastic strides. Yes, OK, just, just so you know, Chris's problem is not dealt with by the medical system, but... It is not, no. no, no, no. But let's move on. Um, Brendan Tam has a question, <clears throat> and uh, it's a completely different one. Where's Brendan? Over there. Closures such as that of the Hazelwood Power Station serve to cripple local economy, uh, economies of regions that are already struggling with chronic unemployment and a lack of jobs. If we are intent on phasing our coal and in the process making large-scale manufacturing um, unaffordable, then what is your plan for regions like the Latrobe Valley whose economic advantages are built solely on those two advantages? Linda, I might start you on that because um, I think the Labor Party's um, mm. less enamoured of coal than the government. Mm. <laughs> <coughs> that is an understatement, um, but thank you. Uh, we saw the prospect of the Treasurer several months ago bring a lump of coal into the Parliament and think it was funny. Um, I, and I will get political here, I think uh, part of the government, the progressive part of the government, including the Prime Minister, have been captured by Luddites within their own party who think that the only thing you can talk about in terms of power, the only thing that you can talk about in terms of 
uh, producing anything is coal. Um, we, and we also saw the, the prospect of Tony Abbott um, saying that Liddell should be reopened and the state government, the state should pay for it. This is a government that is on is, is about is about supposedly uh, supposedly privatisation. So the Labor Party's position, of course, is um, very much about uh, renewables, and it just seems to me, and I think it is doing all of us a disservice, that the whole debate has been dumbed down about climate change and the sorts of things that we've heard tonight to whether or not we should be producing coal. And that is an enormous disservice because we know there has to be a combination um, of, uh, of renewables and a whole different range of sources so of So I'm power. just going to go back to Brendan because I, I, if I understand his question correctly, it's um, what the hell's going to happen to us yes, exactly. once the you do that. So go ahead. The question's more about the jobs in regions that are purely based on both power production and then industrial production that is generally driven by that access to power, mm -hmm. generally coal power historically. Yeah. Well, I think okay. it's very much a responsibility of government um, and others to look at alternative, mm. uh, alternative, alternatives jobs. I mean, it's happened in Newcastle, in the state that I've come from, where there was an enormous reliance um, uh, on coal, um, and um, it's happened in other places in this country. It's not impossible to imagine a different future. But the point that I'm making is that the debate we're having on climate and climate change and renewables and power in Australia is incredibly limited and it should not be, which is probably why you're asking the question. I'm going to go to Tim. Well, I agree that the discussion is that <coughs> because we end up getting into the semantics of suggesting people are on one side or the other. What we know is that if we're going to provide the energy um, resources we need for this country, we need a mixture of resources, it's not one or the other. Um, but to go straight to the question um, specifically about what's going to happen in places like Latrobe Valley, that's exactly what the government is seeking to do. It's making uh, recently made an investment into using um, coal to be turned into hydrogen as a potential energy source for the future of the country so that we can actually have the technologies, the renewable technologies for the future. So that's an um, experimental it's investment. Technology. It's been debunked. It's not a viable hydrogen. solution. Hydrogen. Oh, I thought you were talking about... Yeah, that's right, hydrogen. Um, <laughs> uh, hi hydrogen investment that we can then use the basis for energy. And so that's currently being explored. There's a $50 million investment there um, for, is, as something as a job opportunity. Are there for. any other countries in the world who are looking at this technology? Japan. And under what circumstances do you think, what percentage of our energy mix will it be able to solve? Because we have already proven technology using, used around the world in many different types of renewable um, technologies that Australia would be perfect for to just replace the uh, energy production, so whether it be solar, wind, or a mixture of other proven, internationally validated, like the UK just ran for a few days on solar, Portugal ran for a few days, like many countries around the world are we basically decarbonizing. <laughs> exactly. So it seems ridiculous that you're trying to talk about some new $50 million when we all spend $50 on the solar panels in well, the Latrobe Valley. So, Tim, Tim can, I just, can I just interrupt? Because uh, there's an obvious question for you as a, as a kind of free marketeer, and that is whether governments, as has been suggested, should get involved in buying and building coal-fired power stations. Now, I, don't so, I, I don't support governments getting in buying coal-fired power stations, but we have to go back to the, the original point, which is what are we actually doing for the Latrobe Valley? We're actually trying to give it a future. And... I'm sorry, you can talk just about renewables as part of our energy mix. It's not just part of our energy mix now and it's not just going to be the sole part in the future. It's a critical component of our future but it has to be part of a mix that delivers it because if not, we know what will happen. The price of energy will continue to rise you have and no... it will have a direct impact specifically on people who are contributing, uh, who are living off Newstart and the like no. will then feel the pressure. <laughs> well, higher prices will hit the poorest hardest. Uh, <laughs> Higher prices will hit the poorest heart. OK, so um, um, just, just quickly, I'd quite like to get an answer for Brendan. Uh, is, is the government going to make a priority of creating new jobs 
in the er in the area was going to lose so many jobs uh, when this power station in was shut. In a viable, down. proven, renewable technology. Well, no, I didn't say that. Well, I said well, any jobs. <laughs> I've just outlined for the third time that we're actually making investments to actually create hydrogen power or try and explore hydrogen power down La Trobe Valley, and I'm quite sure there'll be other other avenues pursued to give sustainable jobs. Uh, to La Trobe Valley. Uh, Trump, Brent, I mean... I was kind of, the last word here should go to Brendan. Um, you've heard both sides of politics. I mean, are you confident that your lives are secure? I'd, I'd say no, because I, as, <laughs> as my question um, inferred that these are areas that already had high levels of unemployment. It's chronic unemployment. It's in, intergenerational unemployment. Because So the issues being there before Hazelwood was closed. So governments have decades to solve these problems, and they have yet to do so. So I'm worried that that will continue. It'll we're, worsen. we're going to give you the last word on this program because we're running out of time. In fact, we've run out of time. That is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel and our questioners, uh, Jeremy Hymans, uh, Tim Wilson, Leila Ajaalu, uh, Stanley Johnson and Linda Burney. Thank you. Thank you. Now... You can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Tracy Holmes is joined by Professor Dale Dominey Howes. Uh, next Monday on Q&A, we'll dive deep into the budget with the Shadow Treasurer, Chris Bowen. Now, we did ask the Treasurer, Scott Morrison, to join us to answer your questions, as Joe Hockey did after each of his budgets. Once again, uh, Mr Morrison has refused to do so. But we will be joined by the Minister for Law Enforcement, Angus Taylor, who has a Master's Degree in economics from Oxford. Plus the <laughs> chair of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, Elizabeth Proust, economist and columnist for the Australian, Judith Sloan, and the director of the Australia Institute, Ben Oquist. Till next Monday, good night. Just this month, a Chinese bank opened a branch run entirely by robots. For when you want financial advice from someone without a soul, but can't find an AMP. The Weekly, Wednesday after Gruen on ABC and iView. Ladies, we need to talk. Yumi Stein's here, back with Series 2 of the podcast with no no-go zones. We're taking a deep dive into a range of tricky topics. New Ladies, We Need to Talk, now on ABC Listen. Tomorrow. She's the best listener in the world, you see, so she can get anything out of anybody. It's time to meet the real Camilla. She knew that she had the love and support of the Prince of Wales. Featuring unprecedented access and interviews with those closest to her. I thought, how brave you are. The real Camilla. Tomorrow at 9 on ABC. Tonight, the Prime Minister unveils a $24 billion boost to roads and rail ahead of tomorrow's budget. <music> Holding water, the government strikes a deal with Labor to keep the Murray-Darling Basin plan on track. A historic moment and it shows that this parliament can act as one, can deliver outcomes for the Australian people that we should all be proud of. An expert health panel rules PFAS chemicals are not linked to a greater cancer risk. And a mix of familiar faces and rising stars named in the Socceroos' preliminary World Cup squad. Hello and welcome to The Late News. I'm Karina Cavallio. In his third budget, Scott Morrison is about to put the nation's finances closer towards the surplus that's eluded his two predecessors. The Treasurer has spent the day sharing details with Cabinet colleagues of his plan to limit tax growth, contain the debt blowout and aim for a faster return to surplus. Tonight's coverage begins with this budget overview from National Affairs correspondent Greg Jennett.
tell us about what we can expect tomorrow. <laughs> Better tomorrows are the safest of budget bets. A stronger economy is what this budget is about. Because no Treasurer wants to keep writing the same bleak budget tale of the last decade. It's always about living within our means as a government. And this is a government that does that. Scott Morrison's an election win away from what seemed an ever receding surplus finish line, ending the deep dive into double digit billion dollar deficits that started in the 20s, deteriorated and dipped through the 50s, 40s and 30s. And by the budget after this one, will be borderline or into the black, which is a liberating place for finance ministers. All right, in your hands. Who've all been caged in by weak revenue. Our plan uh, to get the budget back into balance uh, is working uh, and this is not the time to change direction. The government's got billions and billions of dollars uh, rolling through the door at the moment. The revenue windfalls booking a double benefit, not only the return to surplus but also a slashed revision for peak debt. We don't want to throw a mountain of debt onto the shoulders of our children and grandchildren. Still leaving the way open for that targeted modest tax relief in the short term Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Everyone. and the promise of more to come if the coalition manages to sell its plan at an election. It's a mark of the government's confidence the decade of deficits is close to ending that it's now placing a kind of cap on the amount of tax it scrapes out of the economy. The cap itself isn't economically significant. But it does confirm the next election will be set as a test of voters' tax-paying tolerances. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Canberra. The Treasurer is keeping most of the finer details of his budget under wraps until tomorrow. Those modest tax cuts and a multi-billion dollar package aimed at older Australians are among its centrepieces. Political editor Andrew Proben has more. Scott Morrison's told us not to expect mammoth tax cuts and from what the ABC has gleaned, he's spot on. The government will tomorrow extend a tax break that goes to low and middle income earners. Currently, three million people earning less than $37,000 a year get a tax offset worth $445, decreasing in value until it cuts out at incomes of $67,000. It's understood this offset will be increased to $1,000 in tomorrow's budget and the cutoff raised to incomes closer to $100,000. Low income earners will get the biggest benefit, with tax cuts worth about $10.50 a week. Clearly, a personal income tax cut that prioritises low- and middle-income earners in the first instance, uh, of course, is good for them and it's good for the economy. Lifting the low-income tax offset, as opposed to lifting thresholds, is not only a very targeted way of delivering tax relief, it's also relatively cheap, at about 4 or $5 billion. There'll be other elements to the government's tax story. Australians on higher incomes will likely be promised relief through a trajectory of tax cuts over the decade, a bit like the way the Howard government envisaged aspirational tax cuts. And as part of the widely anticipated aged package, the ABC understands the government will expand the pensions loan scheme to help older Australians top up their income by borrowing on the value of their home. Andrew Proben reporting. The federal government has struck a deal with Labor to ensure the Murray-Darling Basin plan remains intact. The Senate will tomorrow vote on a Greens motion which would have blocked $1.3 billion worth of water saving projects used to offset the amount of water returned to the environment. Labor says it won't support the motion because the government has assured it the plan will be delivered in full and concerns over the quality of projects will be resolved. A historic moment and it shows that this parliament can act as one, can deliver outcomes for the Australian people that we should all be proud of. Labor says the government has also agreed to a package of measures which provides a serious response to allegations of water theft in the Northern Basin. New Zealand's Prime Minister has rejected claims her country is an easy target for people smugglers. A tanker carrying 130 asylum seekers believed to be destined for New Zealand or Australia was intercepted by Malaysian authorities over the weekend. Those on board were from Sri Lanka. The government says New Zealand is being marketed as a backdoor into Australia. It underscores the fact that uh, this is a significant issue for our country for New Zealand and for other countries in the region. Uh, we are cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, this 
vessel is of significant size. The idea of New Zealand being used by people smugglers has been happening for a number of years. Um, this is not new. Our Jacinda Ardern says while her country does not have the same policies as Australia, it does have strict border laws. An expert health panel has found no evidence high level of exposure to PFAS chemicals has a significant impact on health. More than 20 defence bases across the country are contaminated with the chemicals which were used in firefighting foam. Kim Smith only keeps one of her older horses on her rural property at Saltash, north of Newcastle. Her land was declared contaminated three years ago. We've lost three dogs to cancer. Um, you just wouldn't bring another animal onto here. Chemicals known as PFAS were in the firefighting foam used at the neighbouring Williamtown Air Base, and it's leached into the soil and the groundwater. It's just got this dark, dark cloud hanging over us. The worst affected communities from the chemical contamination are in Queensland, the Northern Territory and New South Wales. But an expert panel investigating the health impacts of PFAS has played down the risks. There is no um, evidence of um, human health impact from exposure to these chemicals. Um, and in particular, there is no increased burden overall burden of cancer incidents. The panel reviewed international and Australian studies finding fairly consistent evidence that PFAS exposure is linked to increased cholesterol, reduced kidney function and lower birth weight, but not enough to determine a large health impact. We need better studies with uh, better quality data to inform us going forward. We need the federal government to put in place long-term studies so we can see any uh, potential impacts uh, on residents in Catherine but across Australia. Residents on contaminated land in Oakey, Queensland are questioning the panel's independence. You have the contaminators in charge of the research and the reports. We don't want to be exposed to some unknown chemical and be its guinea pig. Professor Mark Taylor says the evidence to date is insufficient to draw any conclusion. There is no evidence, according to this government report, that there are any harmful effects on humans because the evidence is so weak and limited. This land in Williamtown, New South Wales, has been deemed the red zone with high levels of PFAS contamination. Residents here say what they really want from the federal government is financial compensation, so they have the option to leave. The government is funding a longitudinal health study and has just announced a $73 million package to help PFAS-affected communities, $55 million to be spent on drinking water programs. Ben Millington, ABC News, Williamtown. A Brisbane court has heard a mother who allegedly stole her children from North Queensland and hid on the New South Wales central coast for four years, lived under assumed identities. Despite offering a $25,000 surety, the woman who can't be identified for legal reasons was refused bail. The 45-year-old extradited from New South Wales faced court charged with two counts of child stealing. The woman is accused of taking her twin daughters, aged seven at the time, from outside their Townsville school in 2014 after a marriage breakdown. Today, she was kept behind bars. We'll apply for bail to the Supreme Court and effectively appealing the refusal of bail this morning. Police allege the mother and her daughters were living in Taree under assumed identities. The court heard she had Medicare cards with different names in her possession when she was arrested. But her lawyer said they weren't stolen and belonged to real people. I'm not suggesting she was using her real name all the time, he said. My instructions are that she has never applied for false identification. Police also allege the woman and her children had a support network, helping them to avoid detection for several years. The prosecutor opposed bail, arguing she was an unacceptable risk of re-offending and failing to appear in court. She has hidden from police and authorities for over four years, Senior Constable Wade Domagala said. Her lawyer said his client intends to see this through and at some stage in the future wishes to reconnect with her children, but understands the trouble she is in at this time. The magistrate 